Alright, welcome to another video, and before we get started, I'd like to take a quick minute to thank all the Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members whose names you see scrolling across the screen right now. Uh, they make this financially possible, and without you, I probably wouldn't be here making videos, so thank you. Alright, so today we're going to be taking a look at this little wing. It's the Baby AR Pro from Sonic Model. Um, the way I've flown it here, which we're going to take a look at some of the electronics and stuff inside in a minute, but the way I've flown it here for this review and, and in the footage you'll see later in the video, is at 398 grams which is a little bit lower than the recommended maximum takeoff weight of 470 grams with the included uh, plug-and-play power system because this is the plug-and-play that they sent me and by the way they did send this um, I'm assuming for review I just never got any contact it just kind of showed up in the mail but it's kind of the way it works with them so that's what we're doing we built it flown it and now we're gonna review it um, like I said I did get it with the PNP uh, the plug-and-play version of it which includes servos you can see the linkages there and the servos right down there they're unmarked uh, they're plastic gear I think they're plastic output yeah they're plastic gears I can see that in there um, but they're unmarked I'm assuming they're probably just some basic 9 gram or maybe even smaller than 9 gram I'm not really sure but those are the servos that came with it whatever they, whatever they are um, the motor is see if I can get it to focus on that for you and I'll get the glare out of it there we go it is a sonic model uh, 1406 3800 kV motor and the propeller I don't remember the size right offhand it's an HQ prop I can see that and it is a 4 by 2.5 it looks like I'm not 100% sure on that I can't really see it to be honest with you um, but it's a tiny little prop but anyway it, it's the plug and play motor and uh, servos that come with it as well as a speed controller and you can see this is the speed controller that comes with it it is a fly color 30 amp fly dragon light um, now there is no capacitor on here by default you see I actually have one right over here on my uh, flight controller right back there. There's one there and I also have another one that you may or may not be able to see. We're probably not going to all see it, but it's, or maybe, you mean you kind of see where it starts there, but it's underneath the heat drink on the speed controller. I actually added that one. Um, I like to add one directly on the speed controller when I can, but like I said, there's not a lot of room in here the way I built it. Or at least to keep it neat anyway. And I had a couple of these uh, 330 microfarad low ESR caps. And the next thing I had was quite a bit bigger, bigger than the speed controller actually. I think there's some 1000s. But um, I had a couple of these sitting around. So I put one at the speed controller, one back here directly on the speed controller, and one at the flight controller. Um, and you can see I 3D printed a little shelf that kind of just sits in there and has a little notch for the spar and it's kind of shaped to fit the foam right there and I just kind of hot glued it down and it gives me a neat place to mount the uh, video transmitter which is a Rush Tank Solo it's one that I had bought for another build and ended up never using so it was just kind of sitting around not being used so why not use it here um the included little uh, antenna cable the adapter, the SMA adapter that comes with this video transmitter. The way I mounted it here was the perfect length to run it. This this little fin right up here, I just kind of cut it all flat and poked a hole down through to uh, where the motor wires pass through. And that SMA cable just kind of runs down and loops back up to the transmitter. And these screws, I have some little inserts, some little plastic tubes that I kind of pressed down into the foam and glued them in place just to get the screw something to bite to, to kind of hold it snugly in place there and it, it actually holds up pretty good um as far as the antenna I had this little speedy bee antenna that you can maybe make out there if it wants to uh, focus get the lighting right or maybe not but it's just basic little uh, speedy bee antenna um it's one that I flew on my Dart 250 for a while and I put it on here I was actually going to use this Menace RC uh, antenna, I forget what they call these. It's, it's a pagoda style antenna. I was gonna use this one down here for a little bit lower profile look, 
but I like the taller stem on this PDB just to get it up a little bit higher so that it doesn't get shadowed by the battery and things like that on a return trip when you fly in overhead. So I just kind of went with this one for now and it works. Um, but if we put the hatch back on you can kind of see how, how neat that all blends in and, and works. And while the hatch is on I would also like to point out if we get this up into some light where you can see inside. You can see my video transmitter sits right in there. That's the air intake here. And it's going to flow right over the top of and around that video transmitter to get out of the outlets. You have these two outlets in the back and I'm sure you're going to spill some air out of this little hole in the top as well. But the way I placed the video transmitter there, it just kind of sits right in that airflow to keep it nice and cool. At least that's the idea. Um, so back to the speed controller before I forget. Like I said, there's it comes with no capacitor on it. And even after adding the 330 microfarad capacitor on the speed controller and a second one at the flight controller, I do still have a little bit of motor noise. Um, now, I never tried it before adding the capacitor, so I imagine it's probably going to be a little bit noisy if you just run it direct. Depend of course, it depends on how much filtering you might have in your video transmitter and flight controller. Video transmitter, this one, the Rush Tank Solo, is known to be pretty clean in that regard. Um, I guess it's not totally immune, though. Like, none of them are going to be. But I just wanted to point that out. There's no capacitors on here. Which kind of leads me to believe it's probably a, uh, a quad speed controller. But interestingly, it doesn't come with um, Bill Heli firmware on it. Now, it might support it. You might be able to flash Bill Heli onto it, but it doesn't come with Bill Heli. It's a traditional airplane style firmware that you kind of set up using stick commands and things like that. And I'll put a link below the video to the website where you can get the manual for this. But there is a full manual available from from Flycolor that gives you all your options and everything. The only thing I did, I set my low voltage cutoff. I set it, I don't remember exactly how I set it up, but I looked through the options for LiPo and nickel metal hydride and different battery, battery chemistries and what the options are for each. And I picked the one that let me set the low voltage cutoff to the lowest value possible. Um, there's no way to completely disable it in the firmware that comes on the speed controller, but obviously if it does support BL Heli and you flash it with that, then you won't have a low voltage cutoff that would be ideal for an FPV plane like this. Um, but I will put a link to that uh, manual. But what I did, I adjusted that low voltage cutoff and I enabled the brake because the brake wasn't enabled by default either. And especially on a wing like this, it's going to be a belly landing and dragging the prop in the grass. I always like to enable the brake. So uh, moving forward, my flight controller here is the Racer Star F405 Wing Nano. Try to spin it around there. Move some of these cables out of the way. But yeah, it's the F405 Wing Nano that supports ArduPilot and iNav. We are flying ArduPilot on it. And the reason I chose to use this one is it's pretty tiny. Um, it's the smallest ArduPilot capable flight controller that I have in my collection. And it was also not being used. I say it wasn't being used. I pulled it out of my... Uh, the... Uh, I forget what it's called, the, the smallest Talon, the Talon 250G. I keep wanting to call it the Nano Talon, but it's actually the smaller version of the Nano Talon 250G. Uh, but yeah, I pulled this flight controller out of there just because I haven't flown it in a while. I decided to go ahead and repurpose it in here. And like I said, we're using Rush Tank Solo, the F405 Wing Nano. And out in this wing here, in the pocket underneath, we'll take a look in a minute. In this wing tip, there is a... BN 220 GPS U blocks, and you kind of see that cable runs out through here, plugs in, and in this wing here, you see my antenna. I have a Crossfire Nano receiver, and uh, just want to point out while I'm thinking about it, while we're looking at this wing tip, you see these four little bumps out here. Those are little tiny lead fishing weights that I've kind of drilled a little hole down into the wing tip and inserted the lead weight, and then glued a little piece of foam back over it just to cover them and keep them neat there. That is for lateral balance because the GPS in this wing tip is heavier than the crossfire receiver in this wing tip. So basically you just kind of balance it, you know, laterally rather than fore and aft for like your normal CG. Um, I just balance it laterally by adding a little bit of lead weight out here on this wing tip just to make sure you don't have any weird trim issues. Um, 
speaking of weight, we are flying with a 3000 18650 pack. And you see the shape of this one, it's a pyramid pack. You have two sails in the bottom and one in the top. And that's just enough room to let the hatch close. You see it closes nicely there, it doesn't bulge or hit anywhere. But with a 4S 18650 pack, this top sail is moved slightly up and more forward and it interferes with the, the uh, hatch. And moving it back enough to where you can close the hatch makes the CG even harder to attain. Um, and I'm honestly not sure how well this little motor would handle 4S, at least with the included propeller. As it, it does tend to get a little bit warm running it on the bench. Doing uh, When I was calibrating my current sensor and everything, running it for a minute on the bench, I noticed it was getting pretty toasty. And I was a little bit concerned about that until I flew it. But once I flew it, it comes down. It's not hot or anything. It's not ice cold, but it's not hot either. I think it's going to be fine in the air. And that's on 3S. So I probably wouldn't want to push it on 4S. But with this setup, like I said, I don't have any other weight added anywhere or anything other than here. And, you know, I've kind of told you how my gear is laid out. And to get the center of gravity balanced, if you noticed, right down here in these little square cutouts for the, uh, where the, the tabs on the hatch, these two tabs here catch was the perfect size for me to add a quarter ounce lead weight. These are tire weights meant to stick on to the inside of rims to balance your tires on your car. I find those pretty handy for balancing airplanes. They're pretty easy to hide and to tuck away out of, out of sight. But I have a quarter ounce here and a quarter ounce here. So I have a total of a half ounce of lead just in front of the battery right under here. And that puts my CG spot on with the camera that I have, I've almost forgot to mention that, it's kind of hard to see, maybe I'll remove my battery. By the way, this Velcro strap is not the one that's included. Bear with me while I get this out one handed. This Velcro strap is not the one included, it's, that's included with the plane. It does come with this one. Um, works fine, I actually flew with it a couple of times before I swapped it out to this one. But I prefer the buckle type. I find they're just a little bit easier to get the battery in and out and I prefer them so I had one that was about the right length so I used it but getting back to the camera if you can see it kind of nested right in, right in there you can't really I mean you can just tell there's a camera in there but it's a uh, Cadex Retail it is uh, just the basic Retail that's the box that came in it's not a uh, it's not the baby retail or anything. I don't quote me on this because I'm not 100% sure, but I believe it's a 19 millimeter camera, but it's the basic standard of uh, Cadex retail. It's actually the one, ironically, that I removed from my AR Wing Pro that's mounted right up there after I put Waxnail in it. It's, it's the same camera. I actually had one on there and one on the, uh, the Eagle. And I removed both of those to put walks nails. So I had two of them spare sitting here on the bench. So I just went ahead and uh, stuck it in here. Really like it and it fits well. And you see the lens is the perfect size for the cutout there. With the stock retail lens. Um, and while we have the airplane up, I just want to point out. This is the uh, cutout that has the receiver. These two cutouts in the wingtips are there by default. As well as the channels to run your cables through. And you see I just kind of used the little foam plugs and trimmed out the bottom side of them enough to make room for the receiver in this side and the GPS in this side. And then I just taped back over them with some clear tape to keep them in place and removable. And like I said, you can see the channel for, for the wiring there back to the fuselage on both sides is already in place. And I just ran those cables out and they go through the same little channels here where your servo, servo cables run back into the fuselage. And it's all still removable. You can unplug the servos. You see I have the connector just kind of tucked back on each side. And I didn't put any additional connectors for my uh, GPS and receiver. They're just plugged straight into the board on the UARTs. So I don't intend to remove the wings very often on here. But if I do, I'll just have to make note of where those are plugged in. So they put them back in the right spot. But the wings are held on with these little thumb screws on each side. That thread into the wing and kind of screw it on. It makes, it makes for a really rigid mount. And... The, the foam quality, the, the mold quality and everything, the way the foam parts all match up, everything looks good. Um, you do have to glue the wing tips on both sides. 
I tried to use my usual glue, which is, if I grab it, this stuff, this uh, Bob Smith Industries Foam Cure. I get mine from Get FPV, as you can see there. I like this stuff for, for most of my foam wing bills, um, but it didn't seem to stick well on this foam. I don't know if it was a mold release or what. Now, I did clean it up with alcohol like I always do. It just it didn't seem to stick. I left it for a couple of days and come back and you could just pluck the wing tips right off. So I ended up using hot glue. Um, hot glue sticks really well to this foam for some reason. So that's why it's a little bit rough looking along the seam there. It's uh, some of the hot glue that squeezed out. I just kind of trimmed that off and scraped away at it a little bit just to uh, keep it a little bit cleaner. But it works. Um, I have a little antenna tube here for my crossfire antenna. The one I'm using in here is not one of the Immortal T's, it's one of the little wire whisker type antennas. You can see the bottom wire, the ground wire just kind of folds back, which is fine for this as long as your active element is sticking up. And I've had no issues with range or anything with it. I've only had it out about a mile so far, but I do believe it's going to work perfectly fine. I use the same setup like this on my uh, Eagle, except I don't have it in an antenna tube. I just have it kind of buried in the foam, the leading edge of the foam. Uh, vertical stabilizer so I think I covered everything I don't think I forgot anything um, that's the wing fairly small size as you can see there um, it's pretty neat it's pretty forgiving pretty easy to launch doesn't really stall but uh, you'll see all that in the flight test so I guess let's get on to the flight test footage now where I flew it and trimmed it and tuned it and did all that stuff so we'll kind of walk through some of that now so as you can see here, we're going to uh, go ahead and launch. This is the maiden flight. We went ahead and did an auto launch, which went fairly good. There's no real surprises or anything. You can see it's kind of climbing out, doing its thing as you would expect. So we're going to let it loiter for just a bit while it gets a read on the uh, airspeed and wind speed. So we don't have an airspeed sensor, obviously. Uh, just a basic flight controller with a GPS. It's the only external sensor. And Letting it loiter like this will give it a more accurate read on the uh, actual ground speed versus air speed and wind speed. It kind of estimates the wind speed and base the air speed off of that. But it does a pretty good job of it if you let it loiter a couple of times and get a feel for it. Um, you can see it's sitting around 5-ish or so miles an hour wind, but it is a pretty gusty wind. It's kind of rough. As I did fly a little bit earlier in the day. Um, I wasn't sure what the weather was going to do later on this particular day, so I wanted to fly while I had the chance. So we didn't really wait for everything to calm down and settle late in the afternoon, or late in the evening, anything. We're just kind of flying it in the afternoon. Um, so as you can see, we've started auto-tune now. We're going to auto-tune the roll axis first. So we basically just switched to auto-tune mode, and we're just banging the stick left and right. Kind of hold it full left, hold it full right, and let it learn its things. It, it tunes the PID and FF controller while you're doing this. And if you notice down where my messages pop up on the lower, you see that one. The roll D it gives you a D value that it's calculated and tuned on the lower left side there. You'll see a D value, and then if you pay attention, you'll see the wing start to kind of oscillate in the roll axis. And there's the, your uh, roll P value. And if you keep watching, you'll see it say roll finished. So once that's done, you can go on to the pitch axis. So to do that one, we're going to turn and kind of face back towards home so that we don't get too far away while we're doing it. And uh, we'll just start doing the same thing, just banging the elevator full back, full down, full back, full down, and it'll kind of learn some values for the pitch axis. And while I'm doing this, I make it a point to hold a little bit you know, hold the up elevator a little bit longer than the down elevator, just kind of keep an eye on my altitude so that we don't end up losing too much altitude. You see a D value there for your pitch has come up. And it's a little bit more ev evident. You can see it start to oscillate in the pitch axis here in just a bit. You can kind of see it starting now. You see I'm making a little course correction there. It's still doing the stick. You see it really oscillating there, and then it calms down and gives you a pitch P value. And in a moment, you'll see pitch finish. There it is. And so we're done. So now I'm just kind of 
letting it do its thing, fly, and then I'm going to kind of feel it out a little bit, feel the pitch and the roll axis. They feel pretty good. I'm pretty happy with them. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, face back the other way and go back to fly by wire mode. And when I do that, you'll see auto-tune finished. So now our, our stopped auto-tune is the message. So um, if you notice right here, it's still kind of oscillating a little bit. There's a little, it seems to be tuned a little bit too aggressively, a little bit too tight. Um, at least that's the way I felt about it throughout the rest of this flight. So what I ended up doing before the second flight, I went back and I lowered the p-value for pitch and roll. I left the, uh, I've actually went and, and looked through the log and calculated what I felt the feed forward should be. It's pretty pretty easy to do. There's a, a guide on uh, RG Pilot's website in the documentation on how to manually tune your feed forward value. And I went through and looked through the logs and, and the values that I arrived at were pretty spot on to what the auto tune arrived at for feed forward. And I'm really not gonna bother manually tuning the I and D, but the P value is probably where that little bit of oscillation was coming from. So I actually uh, went back and lowered the P value a bit. So you notice what I did right back there, I was just kind of letting the airplane glide down and I wanted to get some values for the TECS tuning, basically. And we're doing another one now. We're doing a full throttle, full back pitch climb in fly by wire A to get your maximum climb rate. And then you'll see once I do that, we're going to push the nose down all the way. We're going to cut the throttle back and push full down elevator and dive all the way down. What you'll see here is your maximum sink rate. So that's three values that you want to enter for your TECS controller at a later date once you start tuning that stuff. Um, it gives you basically an opportunity to make sure that your maximum pitch angles for stabilized modes, so like for fly-by-wire in this case, are good. And also that your throttle is good, which in this case I left it on 100% for max throttle. If that was too much throttle in the climb, you can limit that with your max throttle value, or if it's not enough, throttle and you start losing too much airspeed and, and stall in a maximum climb like that, then you can limit your pitch angle. It just gives you a chance to make sure all those values are within reason. And if they are, then you can use that part of the log to get your minimum and maximum sync rates as well as your maximum climb rate for tuning your TECS controller later. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and move ahead now to a point later in the flight. This is when I was uh, getting ready to land. I basically just kind of flew around a little bit and felt it out up to this point. Oh, kind of the part that I skipped over here. But you can see I'm kind of lining up on this little dirt road down below. And I want to do some stall tests, but I decided I would do them over this little dirt road so that if I ended up spinning the airplane in, it would be easier to go out and recover it and find it closer to that roadway. Um, so what I'm doing right here, I'm at zero throttle in fly-by-wire A. I decided to try a stall test in a stabilized mode, and I was ready to go back to manual if I needed to. Um, but I couldn't get it to stall. It would just kind of parachute down. So I gave up on that, and I decided to climb back up to altitude and switch to manual mode, and then do a stall test that way to see if I could stall it with a little bit more control in manual mode. But you can see it's still zero throttle and full back elevator. It just kind of floats down, just kind of parachutes down a little bit. It doesn't really stall it. I mean, maybe if you had a little bit more control throw, you might be able to stall it. But it, it definitely is very controllable and forgiving. It just kind of mushes down and parachutes down, which is very good in my opinion. I like to see that. So while I was in manual mode thinking about the control rates, I decided to test those. You can see I did a couple of rolls. I did one each way there, and then I went ahead and did a... Uh, a loop just to check, check the uh, pitch rate in manual mode. Everything feels good. Obviously you have plenty of control authority. So the fact that it refuses to stall is I guess just a sign of a good stable forgiving airplane. Good low speed characteristics, especially for a little small wing like this. I was kind of worried it might be a little uh, little sketchy, a little, little finicky, but it's not. It, it flies well. So with that all out of the way, I decided to uh, come back and land. So now that, now that we know what to expect in the low speed behavior, that's one, one reason I wanted to do my stall test before my first landing. 
just so there were no nasty surprises. But you can see I can't I did come in a little bit high here. Um make sure we had enough airspeed when I pushed the nose down to glide it in. And uh kinda landed a little long, but that's fine. Had a nice, nice smooth landing there. And that was the first flight, and I was pretty happy with that. So what I did after that, I'm gonna go ahead and stick uh, skip to the uh, second flight here. All right, so you see we are taking off on the second flight here. And like I said, for this flight, I did go back and I reduced the uh, P gains a bit just to see if it would be a little bit smoother. Um, I actually waited a little bit later in the day. This was a couple of days after the first flight. The forecast actually showed that it was going to be real calm. It's kind of why I wanted to do it on this day. But if you notice, all those clouds out in this direction that we're looking at right now, that was a thunderstorm system that was moving in on us. So I kind of ran out and flew before that got here to make sure the rain didn't stop me. Um, and you notice when I'm taking off here, we're showing about a five, five and a half mile an hour wind, which is kind of close to what we had the other day. And honestly, everything feels pretty similar. And the airplane is still getting bumped around a little bit. And it seems a little, little, still a little tight on the tuning. But it is somewhat improved over what it was previously. Um, but you notice we're up to about seven and a half mile an hour wind now. And if you pay attention to that wind speed, wind speed through the through the flight, or just or periodically, kind of glance at it, you'll notice it gradually climbs through the flight. That was actually all the wind from that storm system moving in. It was picking up. You know, as soon as it took off, the the wind started picking up and everything. So this this flight actually didn't last very long. But it was long enough to do what I wanted, just to uh, check it out after I reduce those gains and fly it again. And uh, just collect a little bit more data and also to uh, see how it handled the wind. And cause like, I was, like I said, I was thinking maybe the wind had something to do with it. And I know from past experience that when these thunderstorms are moving in like this and the wind is blowing, it's always relatively gusty down low. But if you climb a bit higher, you'll get into a smooth, little bit smoother air. The wind is still there, but it's a smoother wind. It's not so gusty. So I ended up doing that here later in the flight. So what I'm, I'm actually going to uh, go ahead and skip to that now, as I don't remember what part of the flight it is. All right, so you see we're uh, climbing here. We kind of just flew around a little bit, looped around back, back and forth down low a bit and then I decided to climb up and see if the air would be a little bit smoother up high and you see we're at like 300 feet right now we're still climbing I think I ended up, ended up climbing right up to around 400 but even here the air is already a lot smoother and everything's kind of calmed down the airplane's flying a fair bit smoother um, so I think some of that little bit of buffeting kind of bouncing around that we were seeing at the beginning of the flight was more so the gusty air down low as you can see up here, we're showing about a nine mile an hour wind now, but it's still flying a lot smoother than it was down low. Um, so at this point, I was just kind of looking around, admiring the uh, clouds and wishing I had HD. Um, I kind of wish I, every time I fly in a log, I wish I, wish I was flying uh, Fox and L instead. Um, it really is true what they say, the HD systems will spoil you. But anyway, for analog, I'm pretty happy with the way this all works and, and the image quality as far as analog goes. But yeah, I was just kind of flying up here and admiring the clouds and the storm front moving in and kind of wondering if I should maybe get on the ground now or push it a bit. But um, you can see it's kind of moving directly in on us right there. And we even had a nice little sunset developing out there under the clouds, which made for some nice views and nice scenery. And again, I, I really wish I had flown Walksnail just to uh, see what it looked like, but really can't afford to put Walksnail in all my airplanes, so we're going to have to fly analog in some of them. So, uh, yeah, like I said, I was just kind of flying around, making a circle up here, looking at, uh, at the sky and storms building and getting a read on the airspeed up here, the wind speed. You can see it's still picking up. We're reading about 13 miles an hour wind speed right now. But even so, the airplane is flying really smooth. And it would be easy to forget that it's such a tiny, lightweight little wing up here flying in a, a 13 mile an hour wind. And to be fair, like I said, it is a smoother wind up here. It's a little bit smoother air up here. But I'm pretty happy with the way it flies and the way it handles it. Um, 
Now I will say, and you'll see it toward the end of the video, but once you get down lower to the ground in that gust here wind, it tosses the airplane around quite a bit. It gets knocked around all over the place. So it'll handle smooth wind perfectly fine, but any rough air, it wouldn't be my first first plane of choice to fly in it. Um, it, it bumps you around quite a bit. But um, just kind of looking, focusing on this. Um, like I said, I was looking at the sunset and I decided to uh, play around just do some inverted flying with it. And you'll notice I'm actually climbing quite a bit. I was looking at my climb rate and the arrows pointing down towards the ground are actually pointing up to show you that you're climbing but they're upside down so they're pointing towards the ground and it was a little bit confusing. And for a minute there I actually thought I was losing a lot of altitude. That's why you see me kind of throttling up and pushing the nose up. And then I realized, oh wait, I'm actually climbing, I'm over 400 feet now, so I decided to uh, roll back out of it and then just kind of do a couple rolls and play around with that, get back under 400. And uh, yeah, just kind of feeling it out up here in the smoother air and it flies quite well. Like I said, it, it handles good and pretty happy with it. Um, now one thing you note, know, most of this has been around 45-50% throttle for my cruise where we're in manual right now and here we're doing another loop here just kind of playing around with it doing a, a slower a larger diameter loop just playing around um but like i said most of the flying around and cruising i've done has been around 45 50 percent throttle kind of in that range and my cruise throttle in Ardu pilot was actually set in at 45 percent um but what i'm doing right now you see i'm flying in fly by wire a and I've cut the power back manually to 30% just to see what it would do as far as staying in the air and maintaining altitude. Now I am having to pull a little bit of uh, elevator, pull the nose up a little bit because I don't have it trimmed to, to maintain altitude at, at this airspeed. It's, it was all actually trimmed, set up from the first flight where I was cruising a little faster than this. So what I wanted to do here is see if I can lower the cruise throttle a bit to lower my speed and amp draw and get more duration out of it and you can see here we're sitting about 30 percent throttle and it's perfectly fine perfectly happy flying here at around three amps and that current sensor is accurate by the way i did take the time to uh, set it up because this little racer star flight controller out of the box the uh, current sensor is is not very accurate it uses the uh, F-405 wing Matic target for as far as firmware and Ordu Pilot. And I guess there's some hardware differences between the two. So I've always had to manually calibrate the current sensor on this one. And I double checked it after the uh, after the first flight. It read like 1180 milliamp hours right around there when I land it. And my charger put back 1169. So it reads just a hair high which is how I like to always set them up for that little bit of margin of error. Um, so I believe this 3 amp draw is pretty accurate, it should be. And that's right at about 30% cruise, or 30% throttle. We're cruising right there, holding altitude. So to, to set the airplane up to cruise like this in, in cruise flight mode, I would need to adjust my cruise throttle as well as relevel the board at whatever the angle is that it's flying right now to maintain altitude so that's kind of what I was doing was just kind of manually flying it there manually holding my altitude just so that I can review the log and see what actual angle of pitch I was flying at and I'll know how to trim that level on the board so I'll probably do that to set it up for a little bit more efficient cruise at a later date um, but yeah as far as all my flight testing and everything shakedown and tuning and Kind of getting happy with it um we're nearing the end of the second flight as you can see here the the uh, wind speeds actually picked up to like 17 miles an hour up here at altitude so at this point i decided to go ahead and get back home and get it on the ground before the rest of that storm started rolling in and things went bad especially with a little small lightweight wing like this that's not terribly powerful or fast um, so that's what we're doing now. You can see we're getting down lower on the way back to set up for a landing. And like I said, once we get down low, the estimated wind speed has dropped a bit. We're back down to like 14 miles an hour. 
but it's clearly a lot gustier wind. As you can see, the airplane's getting tossed around quite a bit here. And while it's kind of fighting all this gusty wind down here, you see we're starting to get a little bit of oscillation back, mostly in the pitch axis. So I may revisit that and lower the P gain a little bit more in the pitch later, but I want to fly it a bit first in better condition than this, not so gusty and windy, and uh, see how that feels. But another thing I noticed, there is a little bit of slop in the control linkages. This one comes with a little weird ball links that snap on, and I'll try to put a picture of those up. Um, they don't seem terribly strong, but I guess there's, there's not a lot of slop in the ball link joint itself. There's more slop where the Z-bands fit in the servo arms. So I think what I'm going to eventually do is replace those linkages with some ball ends, some normal bolted in ball ends with M2 screws and a slightly larger diameter control linkage to uh, tighten it up there as well and see if some of this little jittery oscillation goes away um, but yeah you can see we're down for a nice smooth landing at the end of the second flight and I guess that's the end of my first video on the baby AR Wing Pro um, hopefully it's been informative and enjoyable any questions comments put them below the video I'll try to get to them answer them as soon as I can to the best of my abilities and a huge thank you to Sonic Model for sending me the wing to fly it, build it, and make a video. So that's where we're at. That's what we did. Um, I guess I'll see you all in the next video and thank you for watching this one.